GPUs are so hot right now, and there's a reason. AI projects don't run very well without them. Since my last video on the topic, I spent dozens of hours reading through documentation and experimenting to find the easiest way to optimize local AI experiments with remote GPUs, all without dumping thousands on a machine that'll just sit in the corner most of the year. I'll also show some of the unique characteristics of Elixir that make it a great match for AI, including streaming and distributed work scheduling. By the end of this video, you'll be able to run your own GPU accelerated workload too. This is Code and Stuff. As always, a code for this project is on GitHub with a link in the description. While I think the whole process is interesting, if you just wanna see the results, go to this timestamp. I can't stop you. The transcription process from the last video was 26 times faster than I could listen to an episode, but it would still take a substantial amount of time to run through an entire feed. To make it faster, I'm gonna connect multiple computers together, something that surprisingly takes a substantial amount of code in most languages. Luckily, I'm not using most languages. You see, in 1986, one year after Robert Zemeckis leaked the details of Doc Emmett Brown's DeLorean experiments and shared the power of love with the world, a group of telephone engineers figured out a great way to build clustered programs that run on multiple machines. This resulted in the development of Erlang and the Beam Virtual Machine. By the way, these engineers include Joe Armstrong, Robert Verding, and Mike Williams. They even made a short 11-minute movie about Erlang, which has been preserved by nerds on the internet. Unlike modern times, where main features include streaming videos and dropping calls, telephony systems back then were crucial. The programs that ran the phone switches needed to be resilient, and multiple computers had to coordinate in order to connect lines. Fast forward 26 years. It's 2012. Everyone is doing the Harlem Shake. Everyone except for Jose Valim, who is busy designing a modern language running on the beam. It's called Elixir. You see, Erlang syntax is horrifying to modern sensibilities. Without getting into a giant conflict, I can say that Elixir's Ruby-inspired syntax is much more approachable. With that history in mind, let's talk about clustering and get back to the future. A program running on the beam is made up of many independent processes that communicate by passing messages around. Every process has a mailbox to which messages can be sent from any other process. When I opened Livebook, a network listener process sent a message with a network handle over to a renderer process, which then gave me the page. When I run my code, the Livebook process sends it block by block to yet another process. Along the way, a pool of HTTP client processes is asked to go download the RSS feed or episodes of a podcast and store the files on disk. The Whisper model performs transcription when its process receives a message with a file path. The lesson? Its process is all the way down, each communicating by passing messages. Because there's no reliance on shared memory addresses, this approach can scale beyond a single machine. A clustering mechanism is built into the beam, letting messages be sent to and received from different computers over a network. Over here, I have a cloud-hosted beam instance with an attached GPU. It has a whisper model process eagerly waiting for audio files to crunch. Let's call this instance the harness and dive into the details of how it's made. In a recent post, Mark Erickson, no relation to Erickson Corporation, the makers of Erlang, put together a repo that packages up GPU drivers and model initialization into a Docker image. The original intent was to highlight how LLMs could run in this configuration, but I forked it and added the Whisper model. As an aside, if you wanna see how to do LLM work with this architecture, let me know in the comments below. The most important file in most Elixir apps is application.ex, and this project is no exception. Here, the processes that run as part of the app are registered, giving them a name and referencing the code that they'll run. I registered a serving process named Whisper Model. We'll use that name in Livebook soon. This serving hooks into the pre and post processing lifecycle, so I can pass URLs instead of manually downloading and sending around files locally. I also had to install FFmpeg in the image, so the audio file can be split into segments. This means that we don't have to run FFmpeg locally in our Livebook. All of this will run on a cloud provider called Fly.io. They're not sponsoring me, and I spent my own money on this experiment. The deployment is defined in a file called fly.toml. On line 10, there's an environment variable called the release cookie. This string is like a password in beam clustering that lets nodes know they can trust each other. We're gonna be running in a private network over a WireGuard VPN by the end of this video, so this cookie doesn't need to be secure by any means. We just need to know it so we can connect to the Harness app. With an app name configured and a freshly baked cookie, it's time to deploy. In this repo, with the fly command line tool installed, I'll run fly launch and wait for it to say that it's ready. If you run this on your own, you might need to ask for GPUs to be enabled on your account. 
With a quick email, the friendly folks at Fly will fix that for you. That was a lot of F words. This Docker image does contain NVIDIA drivers and a full Debian Linux installation, so it takes a while to push. Now that it's deployed, I'll check the logs and make sure it's in good working condition. Based on this GPU confirmation and this start link OK, it looks like it's ready. Early on in the logs, I added a message called node started with a name. Let's copy this name. We'll need it in a moment for Livebook. One last thing before you start Livebook. Make sure to edit your .livebookdesktop.sh file and uncomment these lines. This allows us to connect to other Beam processes. Make sure to turn this machine off when you're not using it. These instances cost a few dollars an hour, which happens to coincide with the minimum wage in 1980. It adds up quickly. Okay, let's move on. With Livebook started, I'm gonna make a couple of changes to the code. First, I'll need to connect to the Harness app running on fly. This can be done in two lines. Node.setCookie, so the instance trusts me. This is the same value as I set in fly.toml. And node.connect. I'm gonna paste in that node name from the log messages and with a true response, I'm in. If you don't see a positive response here, make sure you set up Fly's WireGuard VPN with instructions linked in the description. Once it's configured, any connections to internal app interfaces can be made without any fuss. It'll be like you're in the data center yourself. The one other notable change from last time is to replace run with batched run and to replace the serving with the name registered in the remote node. Now I can run the script and see it finish in 10 seconds for 48 minutes of audio. Remember that last time on my laptop, that work took two minutes. That's 12 times faster than last time and 289 times faster than you could listen to the episode. While I was researching this video, I found that there's a lot of companies that host the Whisper model on an API. But one limitation I saw in these is that they don't generally support streaming results. I find it hard to wait and watch a loading spinner, especially when I know that there are some tokens available just ready to be typed out as the audio is being processed, just like how ChatGPT types its responses. Streaming data happens to be something that Elixir shines at, so let's wire it up. Bumblebee exposes a Boolean called stream to enable streaming outputs from the model. So back in application.ex, I'm adding a whisper streaming model serving and setting that value to true. With that change in place, I'll redeploy the harness. This deployment should be a lot faster because all of those really heavy NVIDIA layers have already been pushed. Now that our updated server is running, we can grab the node name and get back to Livebook. In this example, I'm gonna run the Whisper streaming model we just created and output lines to the log as the chunks come in. Let's run it on a single episode. It takes a few seconds for the file to download to the server and the transcription to start. But in all, it should still take about 10 seconds and we get some results as we go. That was cool for one episode, but we can ramp up the concurrency. These GPUs are really powerful. Elixir's task.async stream function takes an enumerable and fans out processes to run the provided function. By default, these processes have an execution limit of five seconds, but I changed it to infinity. And to prevent this from overflowing my screen, I'm just gonna render the latest transcribed line for each of the episodes. Here we go. Three episodes in about 17 seconds. Finally, I'm gonna run transcription on all 135 episodes of the podcast, outputting the markdown files to disk locally. No sense in a time lapse. it's time for the results. In the end, about 100 hours of audio was processed by one remote GPU instance in about 15 minutes. The Beam is actually a great fit for AI tasks. It already solves distributed computing, data streaming, and has native acceleration. I didn't even mention that you can horizontally scale across multiple GPU machines just by adding more compute to the cluster. Maybe I should have led with that. The best way to find an optimal configuration is to run a real data set and try it out. There's still endless directions this can go. I've only scratched the surface. It would probably be more useful to store the data in a database and turn it into an app using more accurate whisper variants or even using other types of AI models. If you wanna see any of these, let me know in the comments. I'd love to know what resonates with you. If you made it to this point, thank you. I know 270 subscribers isn't a lot on YouTube, but your support means a lot to me. This has been Code and Stuff. Thanks for watching. Now, if I could just figure this dang thing out. Oh, you're still here?
there's there's other videos you can watch. 